Thanks again for uh, inviting me here. I appreciate it. Uh, like uh, Martin says, so I know Martin since like 2006, uh, and uh, I always been asking him to for an excuse for me to come here. So I'm very ex excited to be here and and being able to contribute to his chapter. He's one of the my fair favorites uh, OWAS leaders. Um, anyway, so I'm gonna introduce myself. Um, my name is Quai Nahosa, as he mentioned. Um, I work for uh, uh, McAfee. That's why you see that ridiculous M over there. <laughs> Unfortunately, our logo is a little obnoxious. Um, but um, it, just to, a little overview about McAfee. So M McAfee got bought by Intel. So now we're known as by uh, Intel Security. And uh, within McAfee, we have a, a group called Foundstone, which is basically an ethical hacking group for the company. We've been around for many years. Um, but now, like I said, we're part of uh, Foundstone and Intel Security. And now Intel spin-off McAfee again, and now we're going to be called McAfee. So we have a little bit of uh, identity crisis. Uh, but anyway, so uh, I'm, I have actually my, my talk is a little interesting. Um, it's, um, it's based on OpenSAM. How many of you have heard of OpenSAM? One guy? Martin, come on. We got, we're going to have to work on that. OK, it's two guys. OK, three. OK, perfect. It's getting better. So I'll introduce a little bit of the project. I'm a project colleague of OpenSAM. And um, um, at Intel Security, uh, or Foundson, I basically am a, a global lead uh, engineer for software security services, which means that I lead all the methodology on all, this, all the services for the business. Um, and I used to work in a New York office, but I transferred to France about a year ago. So I just basically took a train to visit you guys today. So I'll talk about um, the Open Software Assurance Maturity Model, which is a, a framework to build software security programs. And we use our, our methodologies uh, based on OpenSAM. So I'll give a, a little introduction about the, the, the model. And in addition to that, I will uh, provide a case study. I'll provide examples on actually how we do the assessments to, ma to measure a software security program and how to implement activities to mature uh, an application security program for those that are, are interested. And please uh, let me know if I'm not speaking too loud. Um, I, I do have an accent, so I'm, you know, if I need to speak louder, let me just let me know. <laughs> and for the videos, too, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I mentioned so Foundstone. I don't know if you guys have seen these books before in the library. So our authors, our consultants, are the ones that actually have written the books. Uh, and I also have a very interesting question at the end of the session that has, is related to our company. But anyway, so I should mention that so you have an idea of who we are. Um, and now I've been doing, uh, I've been working with, uh, with on OpenSAM uh, for the recent, recently for the past, I would say like last four years on the project, perhaps. Uh, but I know Pravir Chandra who created the, the model uh, since 2006, I believe, or earlier than that. So I've been doing this for quite a, for quite a while. I've been working on software security programs for, for more than a decade. And um, one of the things that I, the current challenges that, that I hear from people, or the most common challenge that I hear from people that are trying to work on building a program, like the, the banks, for example, uh, is that uh, sometimes they feel like they're herding cattle. So that's why I have that lame picture that could, you could hardly see it with all the pixels. Uh, but the idea is that you know that you, you, people are doing from the most, for the most part, if you feel that you're herding cattle, is because you're probably not doing the right thing, right? You don't have the right strategy. And the other challenges that I see um, in addition to that, and I should, I should step back, and the reason being is because uh, software security is really a, a very complex problem, right? It's not just about tools. It's a people, process, and technology issue. So it takes a, a well-coordinated effort to get all the activities in, you know, very well orchestrated in order to ensure that you're actually making progress. And that's why you know, sometimes people fail and they feel like they're herding cattle. Uh, the other common challenge that I hear is that you know people become very tactical about the software security. So like they want to know, they want to run the code through Veracode, for example, and get the results, um, or use whatever other tools they can use to see what the results and hand a report to compliance or whatever. Uh, but then they fail to actually have a, a strategy on how to fix the problem at the root level, right? This you got to have education. You got to have. Uh, the tools have to be uh, set up in the right place, right? You got to make it practical, practical for developers, and all of this stuff has to be fine-tuned and customized for the right teams in order to work. And in my experience, uh, implementing software security programs for our partners and customers, uh, one of the tools that I have seen, I have experienced to be very effective at this, because you're actually trying to change uh, organizational culture or cultural behavior in the organization 
has been the software maturing model. In the, in the long run, you know, you're actually making it more cost effective, and I'll discuss a little bit why. Okay, so for those of you that are not familiar with the model, this is, in a nutshell, this is how the model looks like. Uh, the model was when Praveer Chandra uh, created the model, basically, one of the, when he talks about it, when he created the model is, uh, he used to be a consultant. We used to work for a company called Sigital back in the days. Uh, and then we started to see similar patterns with a lot of our customers. Like some customers uh, that were trying to build a program, they had, they were doing some type of code review, or some of them were doing some security testing. Some of them would have like an environment hardening program and, and whatnot. Uh, um, and it was it, it was great. So we start basically looking at these patterns and understanding the little basic steps that they were they were doing in order to to make this these programs work, right? And I'm just actually noticing that this is the wrong slide. So <laughs> so let me let me actually switch here to OpenSAM handbook so I can give you the the right model. And don't confuse you in the process. Oh, come on, where is this with this? Okay, here we go. This is a. Probably not the best picture, but it should work. Okay, so this is how the model works. That was actually another model that I created based on the same, taking the same approach. So we were looking at the same patterns. And then we started building, Praveer basically built this look based on that fact, right? Um, and then uh, he defined, therefore, based on, on those patterns, he defined four business functions of software, software development, meaning that any organization that's dealing with application programs, lifecycle management programs, or developing software, they got to have, they at least have these basic functions. And those are governance, construction, verification, and deployment, which is the, the very first layer that you see there. Uh, under governance, you see a, a, a set of practices. There are strategy metrics, education and guidance, policy and compliance. And basically, they're all, all the practices that entitle how to build a governance structure that supports a application security program, right? Like a strategy, for example, just to give you a, qu a quick example. Sometimes, uh, in, my, in my case, I pick top 10 or top five applications that are critical to the business. And then we use those as a strategy. We, we just focus on those applications in our application risk portfolio, and then we use that as our main strategy. We also pick up metrics such as how many co how many bugs we found through code review process versus how many bugs we found through a security testing, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in order to kind of measure whether things are working or not. And then construction talks about uh, three best practices. Each of the functions have three best practices. So construction has uh, secure requirements, threat assessment, and secure architecture, which are basically activities to help you build software securely. And then verification is basically how you test the software when it's, once it's built. And then the next function is deployment, which talks about any activities uh, that you have to execute or recommended by the model after the, you know, the, the software has been constructed and, and verified. So what happens after that, how you deploy to the environment, what happens to the environment, et cetera. So you, you will see things like environment hardening, vulnerability management and operation and en enablement. And I will give a little bit of, more of examples as I go through this. Okay, so let's go back to this uh, slide. And the other thing I wanted to mention is the maturity level. So there's, you see on the bottom table, there's three maturity levels, zero, one, two, and three, right? So for each of those best practices that I mentioned, uh, when we do an assessment, we ranked those practices into these levels. So if you have you don't have any activities in place, that's a zero. If you if you have some activities in place to measure to meet a uh, material level objective level one, then you will get a one a one uh, scorecard, one on your scorecard, um, which means that you're adapting to actually mature your practices. Two means that you're sustaining those activities, and then three means that you're actually mastering those activities and actually able to scale them uh, through the enterprise. So a good example of this, as you can see, uh, and by the way, this is a, 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 a NOWAS project. So this, there is an opensum.org website where you can download the handbook. The handbook is a PDF file. It's 96 pages long, and it has every single detail. Uh, this is what's taken actually from the handbook. I, I actually make it look better. Um, um, but the, the idea is that you, know, you see the three level objectives, uh, and then, uh, then the activities are defined, A and B, and then what results 
you you should expect afterwards, right? So for the first one, for example, it says establish a unified strategic roadmap for software security within the organization. And in order to meet that, you have got to have activity A, which says estimates a business risk profile derived from secure, secure development uh, compliance goals, and then uh, build and maintain uh, a software security software program roadmap based on, uh, on your compliance activities. So I mentioned the model. Uh, you're familiar with the, with the model. The model also describes a, an assessment approach. Uh, there is a lightweight and a, and a f I think it's a the full way or full detail approach. Um, in in my, uh, in my 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 methodology of, of with working with uh, Intel Intel security, um, I basically when I talk to our customers, I pitch the whole full detail one, right? And this is basically what you see on the screen. So we we have we go through a discovery phase where you know we have we select uh, uh, stakeholders. Uh, and the business that are responsible for producing the software, like the QA leads or the director of development, uh, basically the most senior guys, um, and then we interview them to understand, you know, get an understanding of how the, their software development practices are in place. Um, we also ask for like artifacts, like uh, documentation, procedure, policies, anything that they can give us to understand what they have in place and that we can have as, as documentation. And then we follow up with the audit, uh, so for those strategies like in the case of this case study um, we picked uh, top five applications and then we did an audit for those each of those applications so we did a pen test we did a core review and we also follow up with a host configuration review um, and I'll explain a little bit further uh, in, in the next slides and then at the end of the of the process of the assessment we usually have a report where we have a scorecard and we call it a check or a checkpoint in order to kind of see, you know, what the results are and kind of discuss that with the stakeholders. And we also include a roadmap on what steps we recommend in order to improve your activities moving forward. So um, this particular case, um, this was a company, a very large company, worldwide known. Uh, they're a retail company. And I kid you not, uh, basically I used to make fun of them, uh, hopefully they will not see the video, but uh, I used to call them uh, minus one, because instead of having like a level one, two, or three, they were basically going backwards. <laughs> uh, so through the assessment, basically, we, uh, we, did, we went through the, the process that I just discussed, and in the people's, uh, I broke this uh, results into people, process, and technology gaps. So in the people case, you know, we found things like the secure software development training was non-existent. Uh, they didn't have a, a strategy aligned whatsoever. They, uh, in fact, the only thing that they were doing in terms of testing and why they received a plus sign on the security testing practice was because they have some scanner that they were ex executing every year, uh, but it, there was no procedures. There was nothing else on how to follow up no vulnerability management practice or anything like that. Uh, as you can see, they were basically on the process perspective. Uh, they were missing a lot of things, like all the practices recommended by the model, security review, security testing, uh, secure architecture practice, design reviews, um, and didn't have any standardized uh, way to deploy web servers and harden web servers or the environments where this code was being deployed. Uh, and they have uh, no security and change control activities whatsoever. In fact, they were starting to, they starting to put change controls because PCI compliance and because of the secure activities that were trying to push through the process. And then from a technology point of view, they have, they have tools, like I mentioned earlier, but they were not integrated with, with their, with their with a whole development tool chain, so it was a little, it was basically very disconnected. Okay, so through the process uh, I mentioned, we have at the end we have a, a check, a checkpoint, and this is where we provide the report. And you see a sample scorecard on the left hand side, and you can see that on the on the first, uh, although it's not very noticeable, but if the first column, actually the second column, where you see the number zeros. That was, that was the first results that we got through the, on this particular case study. And then you see the rest, one, two, three, and four, those are the four phases that we were recommending as part of the roadmap. So how we can basically help them improve one level at a time, right? And this is the beauty about the model. The model doesn't mean that you gotta be th in number three on all practices or um, that you saw in the model. You know, the idea is that you can basically take, depending on what the assessments are, where the, where the gaps are, you can slowly move towards a right maturity level approach that fits your organization size and whatnot. And then the second uh, here, the diagram is another uh, part of the checkpoint view. So instead of having like a full table with a roadmap, we just provide this uh, in a checkpoint after each uh, project phase. So for example, after project phase one, phase two, we have a checkpoint and we provide this 
uh, scorecard to view where we at. So in this particular case, based on what you saw, uh, we build that roadmap and then uh, we provided themes to each of those project phases. So the first one was the discovery, where we did all those things that you see there, like application through assessment, application risk portfolio, business risk profiling, it's and reporting and whatnot. And then the, what I refer to the first phase, which is planning and awareness, and that's where we start building uh, and adjusting the maturity roadmap uh, after being after having that discussed with the senior executives. Um, and then we start kind of basically um, socializing what the what the program is going to look like. What 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 do, we, what do we expect from everybody and so on. So we started uh, socializing the plan by having like sessions with those with those uh, project managers and, and whatnot that are responsible for those five applications to ensure that they knew what we, what, you know, what we were doing and what, what were the responsibilities. And then the second one is training and testing. So you can see that's when we do a lot of the testing and training, infrastructure and security. So we kind of switched a little bit into the, into the infrastructure, the network side of things. And then at the end, we kind of go back to governance and security and operations to see you know, those kind of sort of tie those loose ends from that perspective. Um, and this is a view of, uh, of, of sort of like a success metrics and the schedule of, of what we were, a project schedule of what we were expecting. And uh, the reason why I include this is because I, I find this very useful when I work with other customers and partners and we're building these programs. I find useful that they see that when we talk to the, to the executives, the people that are actually paying our bills, uh, that they see how we're doing in terms of from the plan, you know. So you can see like in green, you see the discovery phase, I think it says 80% or, or greater co-review of the top 10 applications that were part of the strategy in this case. Uh, so I find very yes, helpful to kind of show the progress every time we have those checkpoints to ensure that they know that we're making some progress and, and where we are in terms of months. Sometimes if we don't get to meet the, ex the expected um, maturity level objectives, then sometimes we ended up stretching a little bit, the, like adding another month just so, so we can fit that in. So this is a good way to reflect that by using these timeline charts. So um, and during the awareness and planning, so I mentioned that we were doing education and guidance, policy and compliance, and the strategy and metrics. Those, those were some of the areas that we were working on that particular, on this particular case. And here are some examples of what that means. So, um, so we, I mentioned already the, the strategy and, and uh, metrics, like choosing the top five or, or top 10 applications. Uh, from an education and guidance perspective, uh, what we did we started to work on uh, brown bag sessions. So very short, 15 minute brown bag sessions just to kind of introduce the topics, such as the one that the gentleman from Veracruz, I forgot your name, was describing like, uh, you know, how, how to implement SSL property, TLS property, all the things that he talked about, you know, we have little, we include that on, on, those, on those WebEx sessions to ensure that developers are aware of these, these uh, features that the browsers have and, and uh, all these other changes that are happening on the, on the protocol so we can protect our web applications, right? Now uh, we also have like application risk one on one. So we we have we targeted um, different groups, right? So we have the developers, we have the the product managers or project managers uh, who lead the, some of the development teams and make, making sure they meet the deadline. So we we tackle them with application security risk uh, sessions where they're more high level. They talk about like you know some of the uh, examples that the gentleman from Veracode provided uh, to give you. Um, some, some ideas, and we try to actually pick some of the things that we saw through the audit so we can connect those dots and they, we can have the developers really understand uh, what the issues are and how they can fix them, right? Uh, and in, in this particular case, I forgot to mention, they wanted to be PCI compliance. That was one of the main e things that, that ex actually got me in the door because they, uh, uh, the, the PCI auditor needed someone to help them uh, interview the developers. And since I've been doing development since I was nine years old, um, I, I was the guy to help him out, and um, so based on based on that, uh, you know, the company really what that's one that was basically one of the main goals. They wanted to achieve PCI requirement 6.5, which talks about secure software development, and that's how they brought us in to kind of help them out, build that from from the bottom up. Um, yeah, some other examples: PCI is top 25, PCI is uh, OWASP top 10, and, and and so on. And then like the secure development life cycle that describes what we were trying to implement from a technical point of view. Uh, we also build a, a SharePoint knowledge base to kind of put all this information and start building all this content in there and make it e easier for developers to find uh, some of the things that some of the guys that we were writing, uh, some of the policies and whatnot, and as well as um, security requirements and the standards. And uh, we also started to work with the PCI uh, or the, the compliance team to kind of build a project audit. 
and thereby building a, a practice uh, meeting those uh, particular objectives. The one thing we also did, and actually I did this on, the, on one of the AppSec uh, US uh, summits, uh, I think it was like two or three years ago with some of our, uh, our uh, leaders. And what we did was, um, which actually helped me for this project, uh, we took all the PCI requirements for DSS 3.0 back in the day, and then we matched uh, the mature objective uh, that we, and we needed to meet in order to meet that requirement. So this is basically a metrics that we built and it's how we actually helped our customer meet those requirements. And then for uh, training and testing, uh, so in this phase we basically start working, uh, we continue to push the education and guidance activities in an effort uh, a little bit more in advance, I would say. So we, we, we continue the brown bag sessions, but then we start introducing real uh, hands-on training with developers. So we actually set up uh, labs where we have uh, Visual Studio uh, and have the developers actually have some code. So we have a, a fake apps. Uh, you hear a web code. So we have something called Hack Me, <laughs> Hack Me Bank, um, which is a, a .NET application and there is a Java version of it. And we use that tool, that, that code, to basically um, teach the class and find work with the developers so they can review the code, find the issues, and most importantly, how they can fix those issues and avoid them in the future. And we also started working with like uh, in the testing side. So you see like the core review and security testing. So for us testing, we started building checklists. So you, again, one of the, the, the nice things about the model is that it asks you to, or well, describes it, to build the practices one, one step at a time. So the idea is to crawl before you can walk, work before you can run, right? So one of the first steps that we, that we work with when we're building a program like this is just building a basic checklist for testing. Uh, so how do you test for, the, uh, in that net, how do you test for input validation for like trying to find uh, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities or SQL injection, et cetera, et cetera. So we look for the, th those items, those issues that we see through the audit and the ones that are more, more, more common. And we try to have that part of the checklist so we can um, not only socialize what we're doing so that people know, the developers know what we're testing for, but also to kind of uh, document and put a structure to build a practice. Uh, the same idea with the uh, uh, core review. So we have also a checklist for core review. And again, the, we actually optimize this for a specific uh, framework. So in this case, it was a, we, we have a guidelines, what we call writing secure code for that net. And we built, started building uh, sheet sheets similar to like the OWASP uh, sheet sheets. Uh, in order to start kind of building them into a kind of, of guidelines, more mature guidelines. And it, again, starting step by step until you build something uh, more mature. And uh, we continue with uh, testing applications, like, although extending our, our, our application portfolio, risk portfolio. And uh, we also here, that's why we introduced the vulnerability management because that's when we, we actually build a team and we say this is a this is the uh, software security group responsible for this. If you have any issues or you find anything, this is these are the contact. These are the, how you can reach out to us and, and formally engage us. <clears throat> okay, so another thing that that um, I've been actually pushing through the project, uh, but so far nobody has listened to me. <laughs> um, but one of the things that we uh, that and even Pravir is, has been big fan of this is um, what what he refers to as playbooks. We, and now we refer to as playbooks. But they're basically, as you can see, they're cross-functional charts or swim lanes uh, that break the process of you know, what is to expect. In this case, is how, what is the remediation, the bug remediation process. So this is what we refer to as the bug remediation playbook. And you can see on this side, right there, the SSSG that stands for the Software Security Group. And then you see the QA team, and then you see the dev team. And then you can see how the processes start, right? So usually the dev team orders a security review, of a, of a change release or some code that has been developed, and then our team grabs the ticket. Uh, we use, uh, in, in this case, we actually used uh, TFS uh, significantly for everything that we do. We actually tried to use that tool significantly to even do security testing at the, at the lowest levels that we, as we could. Um, but anyway, our process was using the tool to actually even request code reviews. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, sure. Let's see if I can do that. Let me see. Is that Yeah, it's not, it's not doing, letting me do it. Let me see if I can do this little trick. No. Yeah, sorry. But anyway, so um, I'll, I'll try to explain to you. So yeah, so we receive a ticket. 
Then uh, we perform some security review, right? We do a core review, we run some tools as well as part of our methodology. And then um, uh, we provide a, a, a report, the results of that through the, through the tool that's worked with TFS and assigning to the right developers. And then we basically wait for them to fix, to provide the, the remediation and commit, and, and commit the fix. Um, then once the fix is committed, we change, actually you can see it here, it does, I don't know how, how hard it's, it is to see it, but in these in this, uh, uh, columns you have new, active, result, and close, and that's basically the status of the ticket. Uh, so we change from new to active, once we're, when we're actually actively testing it, reviewing for the vulnerabilities. And then once we kind of provide that, we, we can verify that uh, it has been fixed, we set in its result status, uh, and then there we let the QA team basically do functional testing and regression testing to ensure that nothing was broken. And then once we can verify that they, nothing was broken and the fix actually works, then we, you know, we deploy the code to production and then we can basically close the ticket. But the whole idea is to represent exactly you know, what, what to expect from each team through that particular process. Uh, and having something like this is extremely helpful in my experience to get everybody on board and understanding of what, what, you know, how that should look like, right? Okay. Um, then the next phase, um, we basically, when we got to this point, we were basically looking more into the construction. So we did a lot of testing. We did a little, a little bit like kind of like the top-down approach, right? Um, and then we, so therefore we started kind of spending more time in the threat assessment. Uh, secure architecture, design review, core review. We, we, continue, we continue with the core review and at the core level, and but kind of trying to tie in the threat assessment versus the design review, and then the environment hard, and that's why uh, infrastructure and architecture is kind of the name of the themes. So we started building the practice by um, looking at the at basically the whole ecosystem, looking at applications from an architecture perspective, so we could basically break it down into components and understand who, the what, and the how, right? So who are the attackers? whether they're internal or external, um, how they can attack the assets, what kind of assets do we need to protect, uh, and the impact and recommendations. Um, and we also started working with a little bit on secure architecture guidance uh, in this case. For example, uh, there were a lot of web properties worldwide, so one of the secure architecture guidance that we came up with, um, they, built, they actually ended up purchasing a single sign-on product so we recommend as part of the architecture, uh, secure architecture guidelines, to we, of course, we tested the product to ensure that it was actually good. And then we recommended to use that as a single sign-on uh, system for all the web properties that they needed to attach into their, into their own backend and services on the backend. So that's an example of secure architecture guidance. Uh, design review, basically, so once we have the security requirements generated, uh, we use the design review practice to kind of uh, see once look at the specs requirements of the, of the changes or the whatever application they were the building and, and to ensure that they're basically paying attention to security requirements that we provided to them. That's what the design review practice really uh, does at a high level. And then uh, the core review, we started to do more core reviews, covering more, getting more full coverage on, on, on those applications that, I, that were part of the por portfolio. And then we're trying to, uh, we started to kind of automate some of these steps in the process. And uh, yep, and then they, but then we're, we're jumping to environment hardening. So we also started to build uh, in, environment hardening guidelines for like how to build a Linux server, uh, Windows server, and how to build a, a, a web servers in those in those operating system in a gel environment or, or a rooted environment, gel rooted environment, I should say. And uh, so I like to kind of show what does that mean, right? Again, I gave you a little uh, overview of the uh, strategy metrics, but what does it mean in terms of maturity for my threat assessment, right? So in this case, uh, and I like to pick on threat assessment because uh, we sometimes we spend too much time on the code level, but threat assessments are great to identify even design flaws. So um, you can see here is an example of it where the first mature objective threat assessment one is basically asking or describing that you should have something in place and that it should be done by, by each project or by each application in this case. Uh, and therefore start building those threat models for those applications and start develop, developing an attacker profile for the software architecture. And by that means is what I mentioned earlier, the who, the what, and the how in a nutshell. Here's a good example of that that we provided on, as part of the results of that practice and reports. So here is uh, basically a use case uh, diagram where we, in, this is actually not very good, it's a little lame, but 
it should it should work its purpose. But the idea here is that you can see that there's you know there's a server component, there's a client component, and it's like it goes deeper than that, right? So there's a cluster, there's a, some uh, file sharing services, some FTP server services, and you get the picture. But the idea here is to basically understand how the data f flows through the through the system, uh, understand each of those components and the responsibilities, uh, understand who are the people that use right internal external. Uh, where are, are the assets, right? Like the cluster, for example, will be one of the assets. Um, understand the trust boundaries, right? And once you have all that um, in perspective, then you want to do the same thing, but then show the abuse case scenario. So in this case, we have the similar diagram uh, based by basically trying to highlight where the attackers are, and then we're trying to uh, highlight uh, threats that are basically in different colors. So high are the red ones, Yellows are mediums, and, and the blues are the low uh, threats that we found on this particular uh, example. But again, in a nutshell, this is basically what we're trying to do through the threat assessment practice. This is, these are the main things that you want, that you want to do uh, in order to mature those, those practices. And then finally, we um, ended up on the, on the last uh, phase, which is uh, governance and security operations, or, or uh, or where operational enablement comes in and the strategy metrics. So yet, once we went to that to that phase, if 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 you, if you remember the the previous phase, we're talking about architecture and infrastructure, right? So at that point, we felt like we have, you know, we were sustaining some activities, uh, and then we were looking into the architecture point of view. So new applications that were being built had those secure architecture um, uh, controls, if you will, already implemented and they were, they were already uh, being being verified. So at that point, we want to kind of scale back here and kind of look at our strategy again and see, do, do we still, should we go uh, continue with the top 10, you know, or should, are we ready to move to add another top five applications, or maybe now it's the top 20? Uh, should we change our metrics? You know, our, met our metrics are actually working. Are we able to measure, really, that we're fixing these issues and that we're preventing them from happening? All those kind of things is when we, at this, at this particular phase, is when we started to kind of check those things and ensuring that we were doing, we were continuing in, uh, on track. So at the end of the day, by, by uh, implementing and, and focusing on these areas, we were able to uh, uh, accomplish those success metrics that you see in there. Like for the governance, 80% of applications were in compliance with policy and standards. 80% of, of the staff were, uh, they, they were knowledgeable about policies and standards. Uh, at least they knew what PCI was by the time we were done. At the beginning, they, they didn't even know what it was. Um, again, um, we also started working with uh, documenting and whatnot. So one last one other thing that we found when we started working with them, they, they literally, they would not document. They were basically writing emails, uh, asking for features, sending it to the developer, and then the developer would literally just write the features in the production environment. Uh, and then something will break, and then they will start blaming it to other teams. Like, no, that was the database guys. No, that was network guys. So by documenting all these things um, and having a, a little bit more of a process, we actually ended up helping them not only by these success metrics, but we actually ended up helping them to be more productive. And they claim that we actually got them to 20% uh, uh, time to market, time to market improvement, which is uh, which is very nice. Um, if, if you look at it. So again, we, we're not only helping them from a security point of view, but we're actually helping them from a, a process point of view and pro making them more productive. And when finally, one of the things that uh, we found very useful as well, oops, was that me? What happened? Just, uh, okay, there we go. It's a little, it's a little sensitive. Um, so one of the things that I, that I found very useful uh, using TFS, Team Foundation Server, for those of you that love that net like I do, um, <laughs> is uh, how useful the tool does. So it builds all these graphs for you, and we're able to manipulate the graphs. Act we actually can talk to the API and build other fancy dashboards and whatnot. But uh, the, the, one of the basic stuff that we were able to do were like showing, you know, what the security uh, bug latency was, you know, so you could see, you know, how many, how many, how long it would take for them to fix. It. High, medium, and low issues. So the, those are the average days. So like you can see, 95 days for high. So obviously not, we wanted to make it to 30, right? Based on PCI compliance. Um, and then you can see security box versus uh, you know what we were entering versus what was closed. And then you can see the the box distribution on the bottom. And we were basically having this uh, uh, refresh uh, 
all the time, but we would take this as a, as a dashboard and, and present it to the senior executives who were sponsoring, and sponsoring the project. And they love this thing. You know, they, they, didn't, they don't really care what, what, you know, whether, uh, what high, medium, low really does. Or they just care about seeing, okay, we're closing this, you know, and that's really what they care. We also uh, ended up manipulating those TFS to reporting to uh, even time to PCI compliance to so kind of show like, you know, you were 46% or 60% on, on, on what's closed or on those particular items that were closely related to PCI compliance. Um, and again, you can see the rest are just different graphs, but, but uh, we can also were able to uh, break, in down, break, break the, the diagrams into projects so you could see like different applications. And then we were able to see like, oh, this team is doing better than the other one. And, as some, and so for some other customers, we actually end up trying to play around and in, in, uh, providing an incentive by like building badges, you know, so like if the team A versus team B closes in many box, they get a badge. Uh, that makes them cooler or something like that. So depending on how the, the organization, how the culture is, you're able to use this type of dashboards and tools and those type of activities to kind of provide an incentive for them to, to try to fix those issues. <clears throat> so finally, um, yeah, we refer to as, a, as this, the service, as the, the methodology, the software security maturity assessment methodology, so that's why you will see that. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's based strongly on open SAM. Uh, the only difference I would say are in the way that, that we do security testing is because Fountain basically we, that's one of our our uh, footprints is uh, is is, is uh, how we do security testing because we're a, a hacking group. Um, but through our methodology, we're able to uh, tackle these business functions that I mentioned as part of the model, right? The governance, construction, verification, and deployment. We were able to in implement those mature levels and uh, and practices and thereby basically auditing what they had in place and, and improving their, their, their process or establishing a process, I should say. And um, to the case studies, you were able to see some of the examples of how we implemented those activities for awareness and planning, training and testing and whatnot. Uh, and one thing I do wanna, I do wanna uh, mention as the key benefits of this is, is basically how the model allows you to see uh, where you at versus what should be the best practice, right? It's a good way to, to benchmark that. Um, and I don't know if you've ever heard about BISM. Have you heard of BISM, Building Software Security yeah, Immaturity Model? So that was created by Sigital. So once Pravir and I left Sigital, they basically forked the project and called it BISM, changed some names and called it BISM. But it's literally the same, same idea. Um, so uh, my, my point here being that you need something in place, and Martin is laughing because I have to take a jab at Cigital uh, since I used to work there. Uh, but the idea is to, you gotta have something, you gotta look at some model or something in place in order to, to start somewhere, right? And uh, if you look at some of the standards, or the, like some of the ISOs and even some other frameworks like COVID and whatnot, uh, which are not really software security centric, which is one of the, one of the issues, um, the model is, makes it even more interesting because not only it focuses on the software security side, but it also doesn't have a long list of things that you got to do, right? And that's the whole idea. It's just how do you make it practical and, and you can start somewhere. And um, yeah, therefore, this uh, is basically flexible and it, in my opinion has been very effective at, at, at building a program and changing cultural behavior. And that's pretty much it. Any questions? Oh, I do have a question, yeah. You have a question for them? Yes, I do. Sure. Yeah, oh, you have one. For a lot of your clients, do they hmm? start off from such a bad position or can vary a lot? No, no, there's, so, depends on the, of the organization. Like if when you work with a lot of the banks, especially in the U.S., they seem to be more mature. So they usually are a little, yeah, a little, <laughs> a little more mature. <laughs> uh, at least compared to other industry verticals. Um, but yes, there's some of the some of them are very basic. Yeah, so there, there's really no way to say like if one more than the other. It just depends on the organization and how their size and all that. You know, this part, this particular case study this is a retailing company, and uh, they couldn't have decided to uh, use like a, a web application firewall, which was one of the requirements for PCI in order to kind of tap in it. But they decided to actually do this the right way and invest in the technology because. 
uh, eighty percent of the sales were done online and through mobile uh, order ordering as well. So they did the right thing and they brought us in and we were able to implement this from the from the bottom up. Uh, it was very effective for them. Other question? From your experience, sure. So the question was, which organizations? Ideally, you know, everybody would, would, would have this. Um, yeah. Right now, more so than ever, is it the case that they are adopting these, these security programs? Yes. You, you know what? Um, it is, OpenSAM has been around since for like 10 years. And now until recently is when I have seen more demand for this type of, of activities or programs. So I would say that at least in the U.S. is growing very fast. Uh, here in Europe, I think it's growing, you know, but it's not as fast as in the, in the U.S. Uh, so, yeah, to answer your question, there's a lot of, in the U.S., a lot of companies that I know that they're really investing on it heavily. Is that the compliance driver? Is that the motivator? Uh, the, is the compliance driver um, is also depending on the industry vertical. So, like, uh, independent software vendors that are being attacked, uh, they're adopting this. Um, uh, or companies that build software that make want to make sure their software is, is built properly. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Good question. So a lot of the clients, people who, who, who do this sort of thing with it, people who have uh, suffered an attack or? Uh, not, not really. Not really. Yeah. Not really. Some of them, th those are the ones that are kind of like origin. Uh, but some of them already, they're aware if they have a good CISO, uh, they, they're aware of what's happening nowadays. And so they're really jumping on the wagon before it's too late. Uh, well, that's like a loaded question. Um, I, I don't think it, nothing. What makes it easier, in my opinion, is is the people are driving on the top, right? So the people that have the money and they can, they already justify that they got to do something. Because uh, once you have that from the from the the higher guy, the rest is easier, in my opinion, because the, one of the, the the most challenges is to convince people that we have to go to move that way. You know, even if they even if they think they got to move that way, if you don't have the buy-in from the top. Guys, they're not. They're gonna play around a little bit. They're really, they're gonna take it. It's like it's like herding cattle or, or herding cats. Um, so um, yeah, it's hard to say. I, I mean, I work with companies where uh, they, they they brought me in with that. That's that's the main thing, and they want to drive that. I was working for a company in uh, in Wall Street um, that they, they they didn't have a bridge or anything, but they were their their customers were asking for this thing. They they gotta have some type of security program. Um, and they were like, from when they brought me in, they were just really serious about it and everything. Whatever you got to say, they would tell me, whatever you need, just let, let us know. So they went beyond that. So at some point, actually, we start, and, and this is what I mentioned to Martin, that Pravir and I have been working on this uh, kind of extension of this where we're not only just looking at software security anymore, but we're looking at the other domains, the infrastructure, data security, incident management, and whatnot. So they were trying to cover not only the software, but making sure that software was the core of everything that they did at the time. If you're using Bizzle or something like that, a lot of uh, those uh, stretches are already there. Uh, if you are uh, using structured testing, you will have uh, a lot of those, I think. It makes it easy. Okay, any other question? Okay, then there's the moment. Yes. Here's a question for them, for the ticket. Yeah, although this question might be a little hard to answer. Um, okay, so uh, name one of the founders of a WASP. <laughs> and, I, and he's laughing because he knows that everybody says, I'm the founder of WASP. <laughs> founder of many, WASP. Many founders, but if you, if, you, if you name one, that would be great. Look, there's a guy Googling right now. <laughs> no? no? Should I make it easier? Yeah. Make something about your presentation. Okay, my presentation. Uh, okay, so uh, Wait, name. Uh, was a woman named Joanna. Who? From, uh, Sorry. She, she belongs in in the OS. This is Joanna. That's what comes from Crescent. Or she's a board member. She's not a founder. Of OS. Yeah, the founder. Yeah. I was founded in two thousand one, by the way. Yeah. By Mark. Kerfie. Mark Kerfie. Yeah. Yeah. And he used to run Founds in my company. Yeah. That's why, I, that's why I asked that question. I thought somebody would bring it up. Um, 
I know, like, uh, yeah. Yeah, you yeah, I think he got it, yeah. But yeah. come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, he was Googling it. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for having me.